We're, we're fortunate this afternoon to, ha um, to have um, Murray Berent come along to talk to us. Murray, as many of you will know, is uh, General Manager of Purchasing for Al Alliance Group Limited. Um, Murray has been a, a, a very good supporter, and Alliance Group have been a very good supporter of um, sheep breeding programs in New Zealand, as you know, through the Central Progeny Test but they're also involved in a lot of other research projects. If you note out here in the posters at the moment, there's one on um, hyperspectral scanning and our meat, uh, carcass merit project involving um, InnerVision, CT and uh, ultrasound, uh, looking at the parameters there. And I won't take up too much more time, so I'll introduce uh, Murray now because um, we've, we've got a wee bit to get through. So. Thanks, Murray, for coming along this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to you talking about what you think we need to breed for. How long have you got? <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I thought I'd start off with a uh, my uh, statement was, how does genetic, uh, genetics contribute on farm for a, from a commercial perspective? Genetics improvement is a sleeping giant, and we say that as, we've look, as we look back at the historic data to understand just how far we have come. Observations of carcasses and actual bone outs, data and yields at our processing plants, we've observed considerable improvement in meat yields over the last or the past decade. Very importantly, we believe there are still a, a number of farmers out there who are just not investing in the best genetics for their operation. And so there is still considerable progress to be made from those commercial farmers. On top of that, most breeders, you people in this room, are making significant progress in genetic gains across a number of economically important traits, and which bodes well for our industry going forward. The great beauty about genetics is that any improvements made on farm are permanent and cumulative. For a relatively small investment, you can keep gaining value year on year. For an, for an individual farmer, it can be difficult to assess what a better ram means to their operation. But by examining the data from the national ev evaluations, the SILACE, um, we can estimate this. The average genetic improvement in terminal size for growth in meat from 2005 to 2015 is $2.62. Using this figure from an average commercial farmer, this translates to an average, an additional $778 per ram over his lifetime of use. Combine that by the number of rams any farmer has on their farm, and the figure stacks up pretty quickly for no extra work. It is also important to note that the $2.62 used here in the SILACE average for the New Zealand sheep industry, breeders and breed groups who are actively involved in progeny testing are expected to be well above that average genetic trend. So gains by using their rams will be greater. Many of the breeding groups we have been working with are also evaluating other traits as meat quality which is, may be beneficial to farmers further down the track. So if I just put up the slides here. The first part is just a simple one. You've seen all this before, genetic improvements. Um, lambing percentage, as we know, 100 to 130%, tremendous, and going up. Carcass weight, 13.5 to 14 back in, in the 90s, now 17 and a half, 18 and a half. And you take them higher if markets paid for them. The next one down, the total saleable meat yield. Uh, that's simply that when we started this in 2001, it was about 51.67% saddle meat yield. Now, currently, it's about 53.65, quite significant in terms of, of um, meat on the bone and also um, uh, the yield of the carcass. Um, the two other points there I'd make is just that there's such a difference um, across our spectrum. Admittedly, we're talking dual, dual purpose and terminal on the same sheet or same slide. But we've got people killing at 49% saddle meat yield of about $1.50 return per sheep or lamb or, or $0.09 cents CP, uh, per kilo, where you've got the topper operators and some in this room, I can tell you, uh, that are up around the 57% or $7.25, which equates to about $0.41 cents CPK above a base schedule. So there's significant room to move um, in our, in our um, sector. The other, the other point here is this is bone out trials from uh, 2001 up to the present day. Now, it's something you've got to remember here is it's not selected from the general population. What I mean, it's just they select the carcasses coming through and it's unjust, unjust, adjusted for weight and fat cover. So 
the, the point here, what I'm making here, is it's not about the results per se, it's more about the trend that you're seeing there. And from 2001 to now, we're certainly starting to move in the right direction, which is, which is really good. This, this slide here um, is the, all the lambs through, our, through the Viscan. So the seven million odd lambs gone through there, year on year. In 2007, you can see um, you're talking 52.74% sun will meet yield across the lambs. This year, 53.65, and it was in adverse weather conditions, I'd say, from droughts to cold weather to poor growing season. But interestingly, you can see that the shoulder subtle meat yields back 4.47. Uh, uh, the loin has gone up 0.41, and the leg has had a, a big lift of 0.98%. Now, that's, that's really great, and if you, and you if extrapolate that, um, the shoulder four rib bon boneless, um, and based on, a, sorry, based on a four rib boneless, a loin bone in, and a CKT abo leg, that equates to about $4.05 uh, but from uh, 2007 to the current day, which is significant. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, though, everyone talks about the shoulder. We talk about we want more meat on the shoulder, and farmers saying, oh, we've got to make them lean or wedge-shaped so you get easier lambing. All true. But what we're, the point we're trying to make here is that um, even though you're making a wedge-shaped shoulder for, your, um, for easier lambing, we still want meat on that, that shoulder because the shoulder is still a valuable part of the carcass. So... Um, that's great, leg and loin are getting more meat on it where the, the valuable primals are, but don't, um, don't take away that from the shoulder because the shoulder is just as important part of the carcass as the other two primals. One interesting thing I talked about here in that previous slide about the big difference between um, the bottom and the top, and, and I look at this here as an example, and this is part of our Red Meat Profit Partnership trial that we're doing with a number of farmers, and, and this is, these are mainly in the southern area, this, this trial is going on. But the, the two parts to this graph, graph there's, there's, there are 40 farmers involved in this, in this farm advisor. The two, the two points I want to make here is this, this graph, this line here, these lines, if you can see them, are the growth rates of land from birth to slaughter. And you can see in the top performer here, it starts off in, in, um, in August, uh, born, and the growth rates are pretty spectacular. If you look at the average of all the farmers in this, this trial, the growth rates start off and they slow right down, they go along a bit, then they go up. And then the, the young farmer group, which we're trying to help in part of the Red Meat Profit Partnership, their growth rates are very, very slow for some time, and then they take off. The other, the other part of it is here is every time lambs are drafted, it adds, it adds value to the per hectare rate. And the point here is that the top operator is up at $1,200 a hectare, um, and the average is only 800 So again, there's significant room to improve um, in our industry. And it all comes back to what we talked about, I guess, in the breakout groups um, in the last hour, that there's huge room for uh, movement and potential across all um, sectors of our, of our uh, industry here. The other, the other point is you're grading. You've all, had a, you've all had a hard year. If you haven't had droughts in Canterbury or the, or the um, North Island, um, you've had a, a damn hard um, growing season in Southland. And these three, these three here, this one here is Lawnville plant, um, Danny Burke and uh, Pecuri plants, and that's the middle of the island, uh, South Island. But the point I'm making here is the blue, the blue line is the yield, subtle meat yields, and the black line is the, um, the weight of the carcass. So what, what's happening here, if you look at Lawnville, for example, um, the yields from, this is back in um, early February, the yields have dropped off dramatically much earlier. And again, if the same genetics are used, it's just that the quality of the grass uh, in climatic conditions played a uh, massive bearing. If you go to uh, Danny Verk, understand you had a very dry patch in, uh, uh, in um, the January, February, part, uh, March period, but again, the yields dropped off as the season went. Now, we've got some suppliers that are supplying us yields that don't drop off in these periods. They hold their line right across. Now, that's something that we have to look at. Why are those farmers? We know it's for, probably forage, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, farmers who've got the same climatic conditions, but the, their yields are dropping off, and others aren't. So that's something that we're going to do more focus on going forward. Because it's a bit like the dairy farmers; they can look at the um, the milk and the vat and say, "Yep, it's the weather's put it off, or the quality of grass I'm feeding the cows isn't working." As a sheep farm, we don't have that um, data at our fingertips unless you're drafting. Every, every week, which is highly unlikely in most cases. So the point there is that climatic conditions, forage, has a big bearing on, on yields, but why can't we hold those yields higher for longer? The other part, 
interestingly enough, which um, is pretty important to us and to you. Taste, tenderness, colour and health attributes have, uh, play, play a major part um, in our industry or uh, the quality of our animals that we, we sell. This simplistic uh, graph here, in the 1990s we were getting about 15% overfats through the plants. In 2013-14 we got 1.36% of lambs that came through were overfats. And this year to date only 1% are overfats. And through the via scan, less than three, um, sorry, 17% of the lambs that are going through have got less than three millimetres of fat over the GR. That's becoming a problem. The optimum, if you want to know what the optimum GR is, between three and seven millimetres. Um, we did a trial on a, on a breed, and it doesn't matter what breed it was, but the lamb, when we, when we did the um, cutting up of them, um, the racks were so lean that you actually could, after a day, after a day, it's were processed one day and, and cut up the next day, uh, day, the racks were so lean in terms of meat cover that you couldn't even get, um, put a knife through them. They were so um, spongy, if you like, or rubbery. Uh, and that's what we don't want. So if you asked us what the optimum um, fat depth was, um, my personal opinion is, is five to seven, but three to seven is okay. Anything less than three to seven or less than three, you don't get um, the carcass setting in the chillers, and therefore um, they're not very uh, practical when you go to further process them. And also, they lose the tenderness, the taste um, as well, and I'll show you that shortly. So, so I understand you heard a lot about uh, intramuscular fat um, today, but research shows that intramuscular fat uh, uh, or um, taste Taste fat is highly heritable, which is true, which is good, um, but there is, a, there is a modest correlation between uh, external fat. Um, our aim of, um, in breeding uh, is to achieve a good yield while retaining a good level of, of taste fat for eating quality and for animal health and survivability. Uh, we will continue to um, screen size for meat quality traits, uh, colour uh, and taste. But uh, this graph here um, just shows you tens, um, with lower um, Fat, they tend to be uh, lean, but the high yielding, uh, where the, the trials have shown that intermuscular fat with a bit more fat cover, it tends to have a more um, flavorous um, eating quality. And here's, here's what it, here, this example I've just talked about in the last two slides, really. Here's where New Zealand lambs are. These are the GRs along here, so two millimeters, 2.5 and so on. And he, up here is the eating quality score. So as you see it, as you put on a bit more f uh, GR or fat, four to, to seven, you can see that the tenderness, overall uh, liking, the, the, the juiciness and the flavour and colour all starts to, um, the, sorry, the, the uh, eating trial or quality score starts to improve. When you get down here where a lot of our lambs are in New Zealand, um, the quality, uh, toughness uh, and juiciness disappears. So the point we're making here is that we really need that, that three to five rather than that one to three. And up here, I guess it's the bad, the good and the bad. Uh, the taste fat and the muscular fats in here, the outer layer of the containers fat, the bad stuff is here. So we want more of this, um, a little bit less than that, but not too much um, taken off. We route again around that three to five millimetres. That graph, that graph, if you take it out to ten mils, does it keep going up with that same idea? Uh, it slows down a wee bit. One, th one thing, pe people don't want fat. Um, but they also want juiciness and flavour. And, and one thing that we've been looking at, it's a good question, one thing we've been looking at is um, that high yielding carcasses. Once you start getting over 61, 62% subtle meat yield, the meat becomes scarce being tough. A bit like what uh, the pork industry happened in Belgium. They took so much um, 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 fat off the, off the pigs, it made them very, very lean, it made them high yielding, but they became very, very tough and tasteless. That's what we don't want to happen in our industry. So 56, 57 is fine. Um, that three to three to nine mil or seven millimeters fat's great, um, with a lot of intramuscular fat as well. That's the perfect the perfect sheep. If you want to ask me what that is, I've just told you what the perfect um, carcass is. What we want. So just something to just something to remember um, when you're selling to selecting for. Um, we talked a lot about meat meat growth rates today. Um, it's all about in proportion. You don't want too much of one thing and not enough about the other. One of the other things that we're, we're looking here at the moment is, is uh, meat quality programs. We're doing a big trial on car carcass characteristics, um, the leg, loin, shoulder, meat yields, the depth, uh, meat quality, intramuscular fat, pH, colour stability and tenderness. So we've done this for the last three years and we've done over a thousand um, bone outs. It's a big job but uh, we believe it's really important for the industry going forward. 
And uh, one of the things, the part of the trial that we're doing is we continue to screen size for meat quality traits, colour, stability, taste, and tenderness, and pH. These words keep coming up all the time. We're sourcing only ewe lambs and wether lambs in this trial, um, and we're making sure that the pH is less than six, uh, six a pH is six score. Um, we're breeding to achieve a maximum yields while retaining a good level of fat, eating quality, and minimal uh, sorry, and for animal health, survivability of medium to high country, because as you know, most of the lambs now have gone back to the hills and and uh, and upper hill country. So something we'll look at. Why weather lambs? Um, we believe that they have the right weather lambs and ewe lambs have the right um, fat depth for um, both the outer and the inner and the, and the muscular um, uh, qualities. Ram lambs and crips, um, good growth rates, but they tend to be the leaner the leaner carcasses, um, but one of the negative sides to the weather lambs is of course um, the growth rates are slower. So that's something we're going to have to work on going forward. If we start paying on uh, intramuscular fat, um, well that's a really good thing, that means that um, the way farm, commercial farmers um, go for growth rates, that may slow, we may focus more on a weather lamb rather than a, a, a cripple ram, but hey who knows, but that's further down the track, but that's more work that we've got to do. But this, on the right hand side there is the um, Two graphs. This was just a, a fat, uh, oh, sorry, effective intermuscular fat content on taste panel scores, and it just shows you the texture. IMF um, had a higher rating than than ones with low IMF, and the same with succulents. Not so uh, great a difference, but again, um, the IMF came out on on top. Um, on part of that trial, we took it into the UK, and the lambs from New Zealand um, were uh, in a taste test and were. Um, with the highest rating between New Zealand and the UK lambs. So that's a positive for New Zealand, which is, which is really pleasing. So going forward, um, there's three points to this, and, and, it's, and it's great to work with BLG. Um, they're a great partner to work with, uh, and they too have um, like-minded like us, and we're trying to improve the industry to make more money for everyone um, concerned. So the three parts to it, the meat module, um, better alignment of SIL, SIL breeding values and objectives with Alliance objectives and payment systems. We're trying to stop, uh, stop the focus of just cents per kilo, send the lambs in, who cares about the quality, just let's pay on a, on a, on a CPK weight basis uh, and let's, let's um, focus on the quality signal rather than the weight, uh, the weight signal. And align breeder measurements with CT um, ultrascan and um, via scan. What we've done there this last year um, between uh, the CT scanner, Neville Jopson, um, um, the ultrasound people and ourselves, is that we got some live lambs, we put them through the CT scanner, sent them to um, Longville plant, processed them, killed them, put them through the via scan, sent them back to, uh, uh, to Invermay and scanned them again, and then we, um, we cut them up into, uh, and got the saleable meat yield. And, and the aim of this is that, that then it becomes a correlation between ultrasound, CT scanning and, um, and via scan. So as a ram breeder, you can select whatever you want to select, and there will be a correlation there. <laughs> so you can do the CT scanner, or if you don't want to spend too much money with Neville Jobson, you might want to come to us. But your decision. <laughs> the, the second part of it is the, is the IMF, um, hyperspectral scanning. Um, this hyperspectral sca um, uh, sensor collects information from each pixel, uh, and from there um, we can make a much better accurate um, way of of um, seeing if, if it's got the right type of um, intermuscular fat that we require and also looks at health traits as well. Now it's just an early stage for us, we're doing a lot of work and doing, um, building an algorithm so that we can then try and develop this. Um, it's ongoing but if, it, if we succeed in this I think it's going to have huge benefits for, for the industry because we'll be able to start uh, measuring um, um, good omega-3s. Um, health traits, and we believe that's the way to go in the future, that New Zealand land can be, be positioned as a high health product um, against other um, countries' uh, products, which is, which is good. And the U project, again, improving on-farm productivity, but, um, body conditioning score, it's quite interesting there. Over the last 10 years, we've been doing some non-scientific trial work ourselves um, on body conditioning scoring, and, and the results have been quite interesting. Um, from the body conditioning scoring, um, we've got, this is, um, these are um, ewes we selected before they went to the ram, um, and we selected the right ram for those ewes. Um, from the, that, those ewes, we got more lambs at lambing time. We got better confirmation um, and, um, from the lambs, better yields through the via scan, and the carcass weights were slightly better as well. 
Um, and the, the processing or kill date was actually, average was actually um, earlier than lambs uh, from poorer conditioned body, uh, body scoring use. So I thought that was quite interesting um, discussion today is a, bit, a lot about body scoring. Well, we've been doing it for 10 years, non-scientifically, but that's what, um, what we're seeing. But one, one key point if I, or take home message from me if, you, if you're going to do this is that it's all about size. Yeah, it's got to, you've got to have a, a reasonable carcass or an animal to carry, carry a frame. But to me, size is not the only thing. It's about the conformation and proportion of the animal. If it's got um, good co uh, condition and it's got a good chump, a chump is very critical, I believe. Uh, when you see lambs come along the uh, chain and they go through the vice scan, you can actually just eye pick them, which are going to be the highest yielding, which are going to be the poorest yielding, and that's the chump part of the animal. So just something to think about when you're selecting your ewes or your rams or, or whatever. Um, it's all in proportion. Size is not everything. It does help. But that chump part of the animal, in my opinion, is one of the, is one of the key attributes for a, a good confirmation, high yielding animal. Thank you very much. Thanks, Murray. Um, we've got a time for a question. You, you come back, Murray. You, uh, Murray. Murray's around tonight as well, this evening. Um, so, yeah. Murray, what's the Y measurement um, fat millimetres? The Y? Yeah. Uh, that's three to five, three to seven. So a Y grade, a Y grade, this is, this is what we've got to get away from. I mean, the beat, this is not knocking the meat board system that's been there for years and it was the only system they had and, and it's proved to be fine. But this is weird, but a, a YM goes from three to seven and a YX goes from, um, sorry, from uh, to nine um, millimetres and then you've got your P's from 10 to 12 and trimmers and fats beyond that. Um, is, that your is that your point, sorry? Yeah. Murray, 17% uh, of lambs that are cardboard under three, what commercial signals do farmers tell us from what your company does in terms of that 1-2 GR, which is pretty ugly stuff? Well, cur currently um, there's, no, um, there's no negative or a disadvantage for sending in a, a 1 to 3 millimetre um, um, carcass lamb or lamb with that GR. And I guess that's because of, of the industry model that um, not enough lambs and, and you've got to put throughput through. But the signal we've got to drive is that if you're going to start sending in lambs with very low GRs, you're going to get... Um, um, poor quality, and then that, that animal goes into the market, and people eat um, those lambs, and get a, they don't get a good experience. And if you, if you don't get a good experience eating New Zealand lamb and, and the rest of the world, they won't buy it. And our name of the game is to send the best to the world. So we've got to start focusing on those um, on those GR measurements. So um, you have to grow, you have to be a big boy and stand up and say, right, we're going to penalise those people that got less than three millimetres of fat, and perhaps that's got to come sooner rather than later. So that three mil, was that ram type or just farm management? No, that, that three mils is the G on the car, the, the commercial farmer, not the, not the ram breeder. Okay. <laughs> no, but was that uh, climate related, do you think? No, because last year, I believe, last year it was 1.3 millimetres, and I believe the seasons, most, most areas had a reasonable season last year. It's just... It's just the way lambs are growing and the, and the genetic makeup that we've just taken probably too much fat off the carcass. And that's, that's a genetic thing. This, I mean, that's, you, know, um, you were driven to saying, look, we want high yielding carcasses, fast growing um, high yielding carcasses, and that's how you do it. But we've probably just come a little bit too far. So we're just saying, well, just put the brakes on a bit and let's just slow it and reverse a little bit. Because um, you, I mean, you've, what, what, the, what you as people in this room have done to the industry is, is amazing. You know, you've gone from 2001 to, to where you are now, and, and the genetic gain is, is immense. But so we just got to put slow the it up a little bit and just change it slightly. And I think that was um, Leon's point. So, um, in 10 years' time, what will be the optimum carcass weight range that you're looking for? Well, that's a good point. The, the only the only reason why we're not we're not paying 20, uh, having a 23 or 25 kilo lamb is all it's all just with portion sizes that people want smaller portions because they're not prepared to pay a lot more money for them that that's the critical thing like we've gone from uh, 13 and a half to 15 then we went from 15 to 17 and a half and now we're about 19 kilos so we're slowly going up the spectrum but I, once you get to big portions all you do with with bigger portions you've got to you've got to make more cuts and that becomes a cost 
So I, I can't answer what the world will want in, in 10 years' time, but we haven't gone from we haven't gone from 13 kilos back in the 90s to uh, in 10 years we've only gone five kilos. So you know what's another 10 years? There's only going to be two or three kilos. I, I just don't know, but slightly more, but not too much. Okay, well, let's. Uh we're going to have to wrap it up there, but uh, Murray's around uh, this evening and I believe tomorrow morning. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Murray. Uh.